Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Jesus Unmasked. I am Adam Erickson, and I am here, as always, with Lindsay Paris Lopez. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Adam. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing. I'm doing well. My it's the first day of school for my older daughter, oh. and my younger one starts kindergarten tomorrow. Kindergarten always starts the day after everyone else. For some oh, reason. nice. Yeah, that's that's weird. We here in Portland we start the day after Labor Day, so I still have a week and a half of summer. When will end? Please mm. end. Please. Like, I'm so jealous that your kids are off at school this week. That's awesome. My kids are downstairs playing laser tag and running all around, making a huge mess. And that's fun. Yes, that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> Let them enjoy am, the last few days of summer. Yes, I am working off a cold. And so um, if I cough, please, like, excuse me. Uh, but I am drinking today from my favorite mug, the Darth Vader mug. Wow. You like that? I know it's yeah. awesome. Like Darth awesome. Vader, I think is my favorite character because he's like the symbol of cinematic evil in our world. And yet he's redeemed because somebody thought there was still good in him. I love that. I, I love, I love themes of redemption, especially for those we consider irredeemable. Right. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So uh, there's your little uh, spirituality of Star Wars for today. We've got some viewers with us. And if you have comments or questions, feel free to put those in the little chat box and we will bring you in. But um, today we are talking about a little story about Jesus. Little mm -hmm. Bible story, Star Wars and the Bible. That's awesome. So this is a chapter Luke 13 verses 10 mm -hmm. through 17. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is about a woman who is stooped over. Does that mean that she's like, like this, like she's bent over? I think that means that she's bent over like that. I think so. And she's been that, that way for nothing. about, she's been that way for about 18 years. And I suspect yeah. that like people have basically been ignoring her for this time. Uh, they're not trying to help her. Um, and so she's just kind of one of these, she's, She's an unfortunate social outcast, um, mm -hmm. uh, as that what often happens. So she's had this for 18 years. And I was reading earlier a little bit about this. And uh, the number 18 tends to be like a number that means a whole lot. So yeah. uh, remember, like, there's the 18 who died um, when the Towers of Siloam fell. Mm -hmm. And 18 is just like this number that's kind of a catch-all for a whole lot of people uh, died mm -hmm. when the when the towers fell. So this is like a whole lot of years that this woman has been bent over right. and suffering like this. So right. uh, Jesus well, comes into the scene on the Sabbath and mm -hmm. uh, he does something and we're going to yeah. find that out. Uh, yeah, wanna... we'll find that out. You know, I, I was just actually listening to something about the number 18 and oh. we talk about 18 in terms of a lot of people dying. It, it's very bleak, but I think I think it's also a number of blessing because I think mm. so mm. because and I I hope so because my anniversary is on the 18th so I feel like it's a number that symbolizes blessing. I just think it's a whole lot and it can but, be a whole lot of like blessings or a whole lot of uh not not so good mm. things, right? Maybe, so, but if but if yeah. the sixth day is the the you know the pinnacle of creation. And yes. after that, there's the Sabbath. Yes. So you've got triple sixes, which uh, um, <laughs> we've... We well, that's remember. very interesting. Yeah, Satan I, does yeah, play a little part. Is, the number 18 I've really heard is a, is a, good, is a good number. Um, yeah. Triple, it, I think it means like an abundance, an abundance of good. Um, so let's get on into, into the gospel, which is in the book of Luke. Uh, so continuing with the Star Wars theme. And, uh, you know, Star Wars is about a holy rebellion. And uh, Jesus ah, rebels here. Ah. Jesus is about to rebel against a common understanding of the Sabbath. So let's get into this. All right. So now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. 
She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. Your, I, I have to get this out because this is just turning into the theme of the day, but your talk about uh, rebellion uh, reminded me of my favorite Star Wars button, which is this one. <laughs> it says Rebel Scum. <laughs> I got this from uh, Buttons for the People. So a shout out to Buttons for the People. It's just, it's awesome. So you can find that at their website. But anyway. Wow. Um, wear it with pride. Just like yeah, I do. Shirt. I do wear it with pride. I love it. It's awesome. So um, what, do, um, what, do you, what do you think about this passage? There's so much. There in is here. a lot in this. Huh? There is so much in here. Um, and we've got to get through it kind of quickly. We don't have as much time mm -hmm. as normal. So I'm just going to dive right in. First of all, Jesus is preaching in um, in the synagogue. He's not the leader of this particular synagogue. So, um, I mean, you could say he's the son of God. All, all of these rightfully belong to him and moreover the people of Israel and moreover humanity. But he's not the leader of this synagogue. And I sense some jealousy and some rivalry with the leader of the synagogue. Um, Jesus comes in and he preaches with an authority, with a conviction and a confidence um, that I think, you know, is very, very strong. And the leader of the synagogue is probably intimidated by him. That's probably why he gets so angry. He's probably not only upset that his interpretation of the Sabbath is being violated. That probably bothers him, but it's probably also a personal affront to his sense of authority that someone else is coming in and receiving all of the glory in his synagogue. So I see some memetic rivalry there, or actually I don't see Jesus fighting back in a memetic way, but I do see some, some jealousy and some desire for the authority that Jesus is conveying. What do you think? Uh, yeah, and I think it's also important to be aware of an anti-Semitic reading of this text, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not Jesus, uh, this is not all Judaism is bad because we can't do anything on the Sabbath to heal people. In fact, what, no, Jesus, not does, what Jesus does is he goes back into his tradition because there are laws in the Hebrew scriptures that say if your ox is if your neighbor's ox is having a hard time or is uh, has fallen uh, into a ditch, you need to go help your neighbor mm -hmm. and get the ox out of the ditch. Uh, and so Jesus is like going back to his own tradition, his own scriptures. And uh, the law doesn't say uh, except for the Sabbath. Right. So Jesus mm -hmm. is doing some interpretive jujitsu here, as he's wont to do uh, in order to say, hey, of course, if your ox or your neighbor's ox has fallen into the ditch on the Sabbath, you, of course, are going to go help them bring it out. Absolutely. Here is a woman who is now here's what Jesus does. He humanizes her. Right. Mm -hmm. this woman who has been uh, cast to the side, uh, maybe created as something as unhuman. She's certainly different right? Jesus comes into this situation and he humanizes her. He says, mm -hmm. this woman is just as much a daughter of Abraham as any of you. And she 
is just as much part of the blessing of Abraham as any of you. And she deserves this. If an ox deserves this, this daughter of Abraham certainly deserves this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what you were saying? Yeah. Um, so to go further into, um, into the Judaism from which Jesus comes and um, which is um, directing both his interpretation of the Sabbath and the synagogue leaders. Um, you know, the whole idea of Sabbath is a day of rest, but I, I mean, I don't want to get this impression of God that God, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that there could be positive and negative interpretations of that. But the way I see it, this day of rest is supposed to give us a time in our lives to reflect, to relax, to meditate and connect with the source of our being, which is God, which is love. And first of all, you can't rest when you're, when you're, you know, being tormented by, yes. you know, you can't, you know, this woman could, could not rest and could not feel the love that the Sabbath is supposed to be about. Um, when she is tormented by illness, it says a spirit. We can get into that in a minute. Um, so Jesus is helping her to feel the Sabbath benefits. Um, and also um, the leader is saying, do not work on the Sabbath. And he's interpreting healing as work. He's interpreting it as desecrating the Sabbath, if, if you were. But there's something larger at play. Um, the whole idea of Sabbath is um, kind of reiterated and interwoven into the law, um, which is supposed to be for human benefit. It's supposed to be for human, um, you know, the Sabbath is made for humanity and not humanity for the Sabbath. Jesus has said that. And um, and I, I was just going to say the whole system that God calls us into, what God's, what God's laws, what God's calling is supposed to do for us is lead us into a way of caring for each other so that this woman would never have felt this ailment in the first place if we were living according to the way that God um, is calling us to live and take care of one another. Um, you know, it does say, if you work on the Sabbath, you shall be put to death earlier in the Testament. And I think about that and I think about, you know, what that might mean. And I think, what it probably means is when you're disconnected from from God, from the source of of your being, that is when that is when you're disconnected from life. And it's not I don't think it's meant to be interpreted in a way of punishing those who fall short. I think it's meant to be a way of saying, um, you know, you are connected and tethered to life through through um through a whole way that God calls us to which includes a time of rest and reflection um yeah so awesome yeah so uh there's another part in here that I think we have to talk about uh through mimetic theory which is the satan uh, the mm -hmm. satan had bound her for 18 years and mimetic theory helps us with this because Satan, the name in Hebrew means the accuser and the satanic principle is the principle of accusation. So mm -hmm. the spirit of Satan is not like something that's way up out there uh, trying to be against us like a devil with red horns, right? The Satan mimetic theory mm -hmm. helps us understand is 
when we start making accusations against other ones, others, when we start dehumanizing others as if they are not a child of Abraham, right. they don't deserve the blessings. That's what the Satan is all about. So we have met the Satan and it is it us, is us. Mm -hmm. whenever we start pointing the fingers at others. But it's really interesting because Jesus seems to be pointing fingers against the religious establishment, the religious elite. He calls them hypocrites. And this is really interesting to me because I know today that a lot of people throw, like to throw this word around as if they're Jesus, uh, mm -hmm. calling people that they disagree with hypocrites, right? Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting is that Jesus only uses this harsh language for the religious elite who want to ostracize certain people and dehumanize them and cast them off to the side. Yeah. That's, that's where you find the Satan most at work. And Jesus comes and exposes it. And sometimes he uses really harsh language like mm -hmm. hypocrite, or sometimes mm -hmm. he even calls people um, a brood of vipers because, because they're in control. They have the power and they are acting like a violent brood of vipers. This is not the language that I would use. It's the language that Jesus often uses. Um, and I think that those of us who follow Jesus sometimes would do well to have a little more um, humility. humility. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Because um, but, I mean, we all do but, fall short. Yes, but but when Jesus says that the whole thing is about loving your neighbor, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourselves, uh, that's what we are called to do. And that's what should be the goal every single time. And yes, we all fall short of it. And uh, sometimes the best intentions um, at, don't lead to that. But that should be that should be the goal. And when we start mm -hmm. ostracizing people because they're different, whether they're like bent over like this, or they're LGBTQ, or they're different skin tone, or whatever, uh, we mm -hmm. are getting caught up in the satanic mechanism right. because Jesus is all about trying to include people who are the sons and daughters of Abraham, which is always a family that is getting more and more inclusive mm -hmm. beyond our understanding. Yeah. I mean, it says that she was bent over with a spirit. And if that spirit was the spirit of Satan, then it's, um, there's the spirit of accusation. We don't know why. We don't know why it's directed to her. And um, to try to figure out why would probably put us with the accusers as well. Like, yeah. what did she do? You know, we you know, if we start asking that question, if we start going down that road, then we put ourselves in the position of the accusers. And I feel like that's what that's what we tend to do to each other. Yep. And that's often done in the name of in the name of God. Well, we and yes, in the name of God, which yeah. is. Um, and, and you can take the God stuff out of it and you can say that it's done in the name of law national mm -hmm. law and we're seeing that a lot and this is where the civil disobedience comes in in order to be obedient to the gospel of love there are a lot of laws on the book that um in national laws in, in every country i mean we're seeing this in in uh, beijing right now uh where china is trying to extradite people living in is it beijing or is it hong kong well it's, it's hong kong yes yeah, hong kong um yeah yeah yeah. So Hong Kong has all of these protests for the last three months or so demanding um, all of the, the five different things. One of them is uh, more democracy. And mm -hmm. the other one is to stop these horrible uh, extradition um, laws of extradition that China wants to make uh, to extradite people in Hong Kong, who they accuse of having, um, I don't know, any accusation. So this is where like uh, nonviolent civil disobedience comes in in order to live according to a higher law, what I would call like the law of God or the law of Jesus or just the law of love and compassion. I mean, that's what Jesus does in this area is he lives by the law in Leviticus, which is love your neighbor as yourself and sets that up as the highest law, possibly even higher than the Sabbath law. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, there are the protests going on in Hong Kong because, um, you know, this, this stuff about extradition to China is also an early reminder that they're all, that in 
a little less than 30 years, they will become a part of China. And so they're about to, you know, lose some of their, um, some of their, I don't want to say independence, they're still part of China, yeah, right. but they have, they have an identity that's going to be subsumed. And you don't have to be against China to understand why that would be frightening to the people. And um, so there are nonviolent protests. Um, you know, there, there are protests. And for the amount of yep. people, most of them are nonviolent. Um, there's, there's a lot of emotion, a lot going on. But I mean, there's that. And uh, when I think about what gospel obedience is, I also think about no more deaths. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Scott Warren is probably the most famous activist because he's been thrust into the national spotlight. He's facing a possibility of 10 years in jail for leaving water in the desert for migrants, but he's yeah. not alone. Um, there are people who leave water in the desert for migrants um, because people are making a long and arduous journey to the United States. And some are going, you know, some are seeking asylum at uh, ports of entry that are that are probably, I think, fewer and further between now yeah. because they've shut down. Um, they've shut down the ports of entry in many places. And, and but long, long before Trump, long before um, before talk of a wall, there have been walls that have blocked people from the urban centers, and it's been going on for decades that migrants have become have had to go through um, the desert to uh, reach the United States. And whatever you think about, about our immigration laws, there are people on trial for trying to help people live right now. And, you know, people who are trying to save the lives of others are following gospel obedience in their civil in what hasn't always been civil disobedience, there have been recent laws criminalizing some of this stuff, like leaving yeah. water, leaving aid. So, um, you know, when the law turns against saving lives, then we have a moral obligation to break it. Um, I'm thinking also of conscientious objectors. And there is a way to be a legal conscientious objector. Um, but I know that at least in the past, at least when my dad was a conscientious objector, he had to get religious authority and he did, but he himself was not personally religious. So it's, there's, um, you know, <laughs> people are being made to violate their conscience sometimes. Um, <laughs> people are being, <laughs> people are being made to, violate the law in order to keep their conscience. And sometimes it gets very tricky. Sometimes it gets into some moral gray areas. And uh, <sighs> isn't that life moral gray yeah. areas? Yes. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we got to get going because I'm going to take a nap to try to sleep off this nasty cold that I have. And you well, have to go better, pick Adam. up your daughter from her first day of school. And I want my kids to hurry up and go to school. Oh, week and a half yeah. left. So thank you everybody for joining us. I'm going to just say this because I don't know when I'm going to be able to say it again. Thank you all of you rebel scums out there. Mm. We're in this together. Mm. Proud to be rebel scums. Place. Rebel scums. I just own that title. So anyway, thank you everybody for watching. And I hope that you can join us next week for another episode of Jesus Unmasked. Until then, grace and peace be with you. Bye-bye. with you.